So allow me to start uh, with um, my experience from yesterday um, and to make you, to change the picture or maybe to share with you um, the problematic or complicated uh, situation inside Israel and um, how uh, sometimes a Knesset member, a parliament member can be at the same time uh, part of other circles of uh, being Israeli. So yesterday I participated in a drill, in a military drill. I'm lieutenant colonel in the Israeli Navy SEALs in a reserve duty service. So I found myself in, with uniforms, with uh, M16, with my uh, unit behind me, just uh, preparing ourselves to uh, two weeks of a drill, a military drill in the next, in, in one week from now. Um, preparing ourselves to uh, military scenarios, uh, military campaign, theoretically. Uh, and I'm starting with that because everything here is a mix. Uh, before I joined the politics, I was a columnist in uh, one of the biggest newspapers in Israel. And so I wrote columns about uh, different issues in Israel. One of them was uh, military issues how to uh, defeat or not defeat Hamas. I'm very proactive, uh, uh, strengthening the, the uh, ability of Israel to deter uh, small actors in this area. And uh, I always explain to my colleagues from all over the world when they, came to, when they come to Israel that uh, a journalist here or a columnist here has also responsibility for his own words. He can write some recommendations for politicians go to do this military campaign or stop that or do that and one day after that he can find himself with uniforms at the, at the military campaign while he's actually um, part of uh, what he wrote about uh, a few hours ago. Um, so with that starting point I would like to add some comments to what uh, uh, um, Bogi Elon uh, said before, and he was my commander in, in the military when he was uh, chief of staff in, in Israel, and he is also my, uh, uh, is my head, party head today, he is actually lead my uh, party in the, in the Knesset. Um, so being relevant, part of it is to understand uh, what kind of wars, specifically here in Israel, but also I think your challenges in the future will uh, you will find it. Uh, uh, being relevant is to understand what is uh, what exactly is to defeat the enemy, what exactly is to win, and how everything connect to politics, to public atmosphere, even to the media. Uh, what we know today, part of it is that we are not actually fighting strong actors. It's not the same wars that we knew in uh, until uh, 73 that we have enemies we have a line of a battle uh, one army defeat the other and everyone knows the day after who is the winner is and who is the loser <coughs> today is a, it's a completely different situation we are fighting against terror and guerrilla organizations you know it by heart from studying vietnam and other wars in the world uh, our main enemies are proxies are not really uh, real actors. We are not fighting against Iran, we are fighting against proxies of Iran. Uh, and when we are going to a military campaign, when we had a military campaign in Lebanon, in Lebanon in 2006, it was against Hezbollah, which is between hybrid organization, between terror organization and guerrilla organization. When we are fighting Hamas, it's a terror organization that also has kind of abilities of, of guerrilla organization. And actually, it's not about power. Um, it's not about military capabilities. It's about creating the consciousness of uh, winning. How you, how you convince your own people and the other side that you actually defeat them. And why is that important? Why it's so important? Because if you finish a military campaign and you actually achieved everything, and in the day after here in the parliament, which is, as you understand, democracy, strong democracy, we debate with each other every day. Here in the parliament, 
in our parliament, if, the, if in the day after we are going to doubt uh, the achievements uh, of a military campaign, it's actually changed the whole meaning of, the fini of, uh, of uh, winning the war. And sometimes, for military perspective, the army here, the IDF, can achieve unbelievable achievements. At the same time, from civilian perspective, it can be a disaster. Now, it also means that it's not only about killing the, your, the mass of the enemies, destroying the mass of uh, capabilities of your enemy, it's also about uh, it also can be about one picture, a winning picture. If you can put the flag in the right place, if you can convince the civilians here in Israel and the enemy that you actually defeat them, if you convince the international community. Because if you, and I had uh, experience in different military campaigns that we did the right things, but at the same time we found ourselves in a sensitive, more complicated situation, two weeks after that, just because we missed uh, a target and we had, we had some civilian target in Lebanon or other scenarios, which can happen, as you know, in a, in a military campaign or in a war. And I think that one of the aspects of, uh, of being a Knesset member, a parliament member today in Israel, is first of all, to understand that we, even though the, uh, Israel, I think, is the most uh, flourishing uh, country in the Middle East with the big, strongest economic uh, uh, conditions and uh, for sure the only democracy here uh, with high tech, with different many achievements, even though uh, it's not a normal place. In two years, three years, we can find ourselves, even in one month, we can find ourselves again in a military campaign. A Knesset member, a parliament member like me can find himself risking his own life. And I have four kids, so I don't like to risk my life. I'm, I grew up since I was 18 and I was very happy to join uh, mili every military operation or whatever. And um, fighting against an enemy a clear enemy, but at the same time fighting about the narrative, which is more complicated. Mm -hmm. Fighting the enemy, it's easy. Sending troops, sending uh, aircraft, sending, uh, I don't know, commando units, whatever. Fighting, fighting the narrative, it's much more complicated because the army cannot influence my opinion. It cannot influence the discussions that will take place here the day after. It cannot influence the media. It cannot influence what uh, the headline of the New York Times will be the day after and also what the headline of uh, Wall Street Journal, if we are taken to both sides, will be the day after. And this is part of the problematic situation. And uh, for me, as Israeli, as uh, Zionistic, as someone that believes in uh, Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, for me, one of the challenges is, first of all, um, to feel that we are doing the right thing. Uh, it's not about to feel how, uh, it's not about educating ourselves how to do a military campaign, it's not about educating our soldiers uh, about different military maneuvers, it's about educating ourselves that we are doing the right thing. First of all, to convince ourselves. Hearts and minds, but for here, inside, our, our home, first of all, and then to spread it out. Um, now, after I said that, which is very, which coming from your world and my, as a hobbit, I can say, uh, I can tell you that uh, um, I'm very proud to be part of this uh, house, even those that we have, as you know, different debates and uh, different opinions and views about what's happening in Israel and right now we are in a political crisis. Uh, still, the ability to uh, talk, to argue, to uh, fight politically with each other, I think this is what makes Israel uh, such a strong state with such a strong abilities to uh, 
this is ours uh, with Yoda uh, Tivdok Bemet in the uh, such a strong uh, democracy is it actually helping us to strengthen us economically, militarily, uh, politically, and from other aspects. Uh, I would like to recommend you not to see Israel through the current situation, political situation. It's part of the uh, Israel democracy. Well. <laughs> <laughs> It's par part of our uh, democratic character and part of our challenges. Uh, I'm saying that and I'm going back to, the, to our starting point. Being democracy, giving you uh, a lot of um, 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 tools to help yourself, to strengthen yourself, to develop your own country. At the same time, militarily, it giving you a lot of um, limitations uh, when you are fighting against terror and guerrilla organizations. And the balance, uh, it's all about the balance. It's all about checks and balances. It's all about how you, in one hand, understand that your mission is to defeat your enemy, to protect your own country, which is, uh, the IDF is actually an arm is established to protect Israel. And at the same time, you understand that you are also part of a, a political arena. And if a soldier, one soldier, one cop uh, is doing the wrong thing, actually, in the day after, it can be a headline in the New York Times or in a, another newspaper. And w two days after that, it can be a discussion at the UN, one of the UN committees. And three days after that, it can be one of the most influencer uh, um, people in Israel for that year and we had experience also in uh, in that matter um, checks and balances is to find ways to keep your own security needs and at the same time your liberal values if you have a checkpoint for example here in Israel when we are trying to uh, um, to supervise people that crossing the checkpoints to inside the to work in Israel how you balance between your security needs to make sure that no suicide bomber is crossing the checkpoints and at the same time how you give maximum uh, ability to uh, Palestinians, for example, to cross and to walk and to make money and to bring money back home. Uh, checks and balances is between our national character and at the same time our democratic character. And it all comes to a small, very small uh, Dilemmas, sometimes it's dilemmas that you have in a campaign, in a military campaign, when you have a school that you know that uh, kids are actually, be, uh, has become a human shield and protect uh, 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 terrorists that uh, launch rockets against our own citizens. It can come to another point when you have a debate inside the UN between different actors, countries that uh, criticize Israel for taking military steps. It can come also to internal politics inside Israel, which happens day by day. What I try to say shortly is that this is a very complicated state with a very sensitive, uh, um, with a sensitive approach to balance between different uh, uh, needs and uh, interests. Um, I always I had opportunity to teach at university. Uh, some courses about Israel and I always said that if we are as Israelis still trying to understand who we are and how we are doing that and what does it mean to uh, strength checks and balances and what does it mean to ha to being uh, uh, to keep our uh, moral values at the army and at the same time to make sure that our security needs are fulfilled uh, what does it mean to be an Israeli a national state and at the same time democratic one? So probably no one else can understand what, what is it Israel exactly. Um, so the only conclusion that I have, the only conclusion that, that I can share with you to summarize um, my short briefing is that you will not understand Israel completely. But the only thing that you can understand is that our wills and the uh, visions, and this is to be a symbolic uh, society, to be a, a, the only Jewish state 
which keep on liberal and democratic values, uh, to make sure that our soldiers, civilians, leaders, politicians understand that uh, security and uh, values are going together if we want to make sure that this miracle, as I see it, the State of Israel, still flourishing and uh, strengthening uh, ourselves and uh, the, the Zionistic vision to create a Jewish state, a democratic one, will remain here for many, many years. Amazing. So this is my short view, and now you can ask whatever you want. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? By a show of hands. Here we go. Sir, uh, I'm Santiago Lopez from Virginia Military Institute. Uh, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, you talked a lot about fighting the narrative. Uh, how do you go about dealing with that, the internal conflicts here, like the, the rise in Jerusalem yesterday? Okay, this is a, uh, first of all, it's complicated, as I said. I don't know how to control the narrative after a day like yesterday. Uh, but I can tell you that I can try to control the narrative in a military campaign in Gaza, for example. Uh, in the Second World War, uh, I'm sure that you know about it, but the U.S. military recruit uh, different film makers in order to create a narrative. Uh, I think six of them. There is a nice uh, movie about them, how they actually uh, create the American narrative uh, in the middle of the war. Now, in those days, it was quite clear. You had your enemy, you had your own people, uh, your allies, and the first one that actually put the flag or uh, defeat the enemy was the winner. So we knew exactly, the Americans knew when they were, uh, actually when they achieved the mission, they were in Berlin. It was very easy. Today, it's less and less easier. Uh, I think that the American military, or you actually saw that in, uh, Vietna in Vietnam, while you had unlimited power, military power, at the same time you had um, um, dilemmas with legitimacy outside and inside, which influence not less than uh, military capabilities. Here we have the same problem. We, are a very we have a very strong army, the most strongest army in the Middle East. We have a guerrilla, a small guerrilla organization, and at the same time, it's not about military capabilities. It's about criticism from all over the world. It's about uh, sometimes hurting uninvolved people, which happens in military campaigns when you try to shoot someone that surrounding himself in a, mil in a civilian uh, 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 area, sometimes mistakes happen. It's about convincing people here in Israel that the price is worth. It's about uh, telling uh, your people and uh, countries outside what actually you have done in a military campaign, which is very complicated to explain. Sometimes um, Sometimes no one can understand if he is not uh, with his own boots on the ground. And the most important thing, and I'm sure that you study it in, in your uh, education, education process, is that uh, in unsymmetric wars, one side, the weak actor, can actually use unconventional tools. And I'm not talking about unconventional weapons, I'm talking about unconventional narrative. He can actually fake whatever he wants. He is not an actor. We had experience in 2002 that we saw a funeral of kids in our uh, air vehicle uh, that actually pictured it uh, in Jenin, one of the Palestinian cities. They blamed the IDF to kill those kids. Uh, so y we have the movies, they follow the funeral it, it took something like 10, 20 minutes. And after one of the corners, suddenly you see the bodies jumping from, the, from those uh, 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 beds and start walking or running. So, and nothing happened. Because if in unsymmetrical 
uh, information war, you can lie and it's okay. If you are the weak actor, if you are a state, you cannot lie. Or you cannot lie officially, let's say it like this. Uh, so it's also about tactical narrative, but also strategic narratives. How you convince uh, the international communities that what you're doing is the right thing, or the, uh, how you convince them that you had no other options than to uh, launch a military campaign in order to protect your own people. How you um, find ways to convince the other side that uh, it's not worse to, co to continue with these wars, because uh, if you uh, take, for example, the last war campaigns in Israel, it's not about conquered territory. Uh, it's about conquered the minds and hearts of people. How you convince them that the price is heavy enough to stop and to have a ceasefire. It's not about defeating as we knew in the wars in the past. How you convince your own people, how you convince uh, the media. So it's becoming more and more problematic and sometimes you can use the same trick from the World War II and to uh, make sure that you have enough uh, cameras, pictures, people, film makers that understand that it's not only about shooting, it's not only about the M16, it's also about the pictures that you take in, uh, in the middle of the campaign and I know that you have enough forces to doing that uh, but uh, it's also a, a, a challenge here. Other questions? Yes. Good morning sir, my name is Cadet Travis Afuso from the United States Military Academy and I'm originally from Hawaii. Uh, I was wondering if you could share with us a particular experience in your life that has contributed to developing you into the leader that you are today. Um, first of all, I served in the Army for six years, a little bit more. And I had a lot of experience losing friends in different military campaigns, understanding the price of wars here in Israel. And don't forget that here in Israel, everyone has to go to, uh, to the army, yeah? has to have to serve in the army. There is no other option. And uh, you find yourself, I would say that what mostly shaped my views uh, is to meet actually mothers of uh, friends of mine that lost their life in uh, military campaigns. And I always says, that if you bogey that you de just spoke with him uh, an officer like that that had so much experience not in fighting fighting it's okay it's not that problematic to fight we know it for many many centuries to meet mothers and to tell them that their kids lost their life uh, under your ship and it's part of your responsibility it cannot uh, leave you uh, ever and actually someone that uh, find himself in those kind of dilemma uh, create a, or I would say is, is carrying a baggage that no one can carry and uh, it's for it force him to become a leader it doesn't matter what kind of a leader but it's part of it convert him to leadership without any connection to what he is doing and what he planned to do and how he's doing that. He has some kind of responsibility over his shoulder. You know that part of the Israeli tradition that after the military service a lot of Israelis are going to South America, to India, to different uh, places in the world uh, for a long trip, a backpacker's trip. The majority of the Israelis that serves in uh, combat units are going to long trips all over the world. Not to the US, it's quite, you know, it's quite a normal and symp a sympathetic uh, mm -hmm. area, but to areas like uh, South America and, uh, and uh, India, I don't know, or uh, other places. I also, after a, a long military service, I spent one year in uh, Latin America. And I think that part of it is to try to uh, convince yourself that you don't have responsibility on your shoulders. And what you see and what you have done is not any more part of your... Uh, of your character, uh, it can never leave you. And if you ask me what, how you shape leadership here in Israel, 
part of it is to be part of this Israeli narrative, part of uh, the Israeli responsibility for life of other people, to understand the price of living here, uh, the, the advantage of living here, and I love my, my country, but at the same time the price that you pay for uh, keeping Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Other questions? Yes. Uh, sir, my name is Cadet Matt Montero uh, from West Point. Uh, I'm originally from New York. I was interested in what's the final end state for Israel. Israel's been in conflict since its inception and before that. Uh, militarily, they've switched from being defensive to now a, a strong, one of the strongest uh, forces in Israel. So, uh, primarily, what's the political end goal uh, with the strong military that you guys have now? Um, look, uh, we educate our own kids on on peace telling them or giving them some songs about peace telling them about the prophet of peace one day how we believe in a topic world when you grow up and if you're taking a conservative a political conservative point of view like mine uh, unfortunately you understand that there are more limitations and possibilities and you need to minimize conflicts and not to believe in some kind of uh, magic sticks that will resolve everything. Unfortunately, Israel, as I see it, is the front of the clash of civilizations in the world. Uh, as I see it, here you can see the clash between democratic values and other values. We are surrounded by dictators, dictatorships. Uh, we are surrounded by destable countries, states. We are surrounded by uh, values that uh, maybe uh, can fit to the dark ages and not uh, the modern periods. And we need, first of all, to recognize it and to try to minimize it by using interest, not by using dreams. Uh, I cannot tell you that my kids will not go to the army. My kids, uh, I have, uh, as I said, four kids. The youngest one is four years old, he will serve in the army, uh, as I understand it. It's an, uh, my wife always telling me that she doesn't want to think about it, but this is part of the price to uh, for, of living here. I cannot uh, give you some vision about how we limit uh, or how we uh, um, deleting conflicts in this area. Unfortunately, I think that we will have conflicts in the future. What we can do is to find ways to think strategically about the future, not politically. Sometimes we think politically about the uh, problems that we have. Gaza Strip, uh, Lebanon, Palestinians. We need to think how we actually minimize the risks which is actually risk management. And this is what we are doing here. Sometimes risk management works, sometimes it's not. I hope that we will not have many conflicts in the next future, in the close future. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you that uh, this is what's going to happen. Other questions, if there are? We'll take one more question, please. Anyone has a question? Yes, Isaiah. Um, sir, so, well, oh, sorry. Um, Isaiah Sampson from uh, United States Air Force Academy. Uh, grew up sometime in Florida. Um, my question is pertaining to this new uh, non-conventional warfare um, that you and uh, in, here in Israel and America is facing um, as far as, you know, not necessarily being able to have the tactical advantage because the laws of, of war that are coming. I'm wondering, um, how do you start having the discussion on what is the solution to gaining that tactical advantage back or what is the solution to to fighting these these new styles of wars properly? Um, look, I'm sure that you have many lessons about small wars 
and about asymmetrical wars and how you uh, how you dealing with those dilemmas in the on on the ground. Um, this is not new in the world, not for us, not for you. I think that since, uh, as I said, uh, Vietnam War, Afghanistan for the Soviets in the, in those days, for us Lebanon, uh, for many countries, for the, for French Algeria, people found themselves in unconventional, uh, unpleasant um, situation, military situation. Um, the only thing that you can do is first of all to, as I see it, uh, not to throw away uh, the definition of defeating and winning. I think that if you start talking about um, um, only about limitations and not about uh, possibilities, uh, you lost from, from day one. What we can do is to find tactical tools, first of all, to fight in those, in those two dimensions that we talked about, and then to find strategic tools to uh, make sure that those kind of wars um, ending in achieving something. It can be a ceasefire, it can be uh, Deterrence. It can be also convincing different actors that you did, you took the right step. Um, since, as I said, we are in a realistic uh, area, and I have a realistic approach, it's not going to resolve everything, but it can help an actors like Israel to maintain the security here and to strengthen the Iron Shield that we are, and I'm talking about uh, uh, the idea of Iron Shield um, that we built here uh, and to convince our enemies that whatever they do, and it doesn't matter how strong it is and how and what kind of tools they use, at the end of the day, the bottom line that they will find themselves uh, we will find ourselves in a better situation and they will lose something. And this is the only conclusion that we can, or this is the only message that we can use in order to, uh, to plan our strategic uh, steps when we are getting to those kind of uh, scenarios and dilemmas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.